welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Today's show continues our tradition of Halloween time episodes where each year we pick a classic horror actor to talk about. Uh, Spoiler alert, though, I feel like it's fair to say this one goes down a fairly sad path. Uh, So just if you're not ready for that, maybe save this one for later. Uh, But it is about one of the lesser known horror actors that really helped make the genre Universal's great money-making success of the 1930s. And I wanted to give him a little bit more time in the spotlight because not many people know about him. Uh, We are talking today about Dwight Fry, and if you don't know his name, I think only people who are really into old school horror might just know it offhand, so it's no shame in that game if you don't know it, Uh, but you have probably seen at least one or two of his performances. Yeah, I did not know his name offhand when you sent this outline over to me. But then when I went to look for artwork for it, I was like, oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> yes, which I think is what most people do. So, uh, yeah, he's he's due for a little more attention. So Dwight Fry was born on February 22nd, 1899 in Salina, Kansas. He was the only child of Charles and Ella Fry. They were farmers. And the Frys soon moved to Denver, Colorado. At this point, the family name was spelled F-R-Y with no E at the end. And Dwight's mother, Ella, was a devout Christian scientist. So Dwight followed in her spiritual beliefs. He remained deeply religious throughout his life. And Dwight was really artistic as a child. He played the piano and he sang. And at the age of nine, he envisioned a future for himself as a concert pianist. And that really looked for a while like it would indeed be his path in life. He was lauded by teachers and audiences who attended his recitals as a genius at the Keys. Uh, He really was, I think if you had asked most people in Denver at the time, yes, he was going to grow up to be a great, famous musician. Uh, But eventually he also began to give orations, something else he was quite skilled at. But then once he appeared in his high school's production of the stage play The Honeymoon in June 1917 acting became his one true love as a performer. And by the time he graduated from Westside High School in Denver, he knew he was going to become an actor. This really wasn't a very welcome shift in his interests, at least in the view of Dwight's parents, because as we said, the family were very religious. They were kind of suspicious of the potential depravity and debauchery that could be involved in a career in acting. But even more than that, acting just wasn't a career that had a high success rate, and the Fries really wanted their son to have a stable life. So to soothe his parents' fears, Dwight took an administrative position with a business firm in Denver. But at the same time, he also took acting lessons from Douglas Fairbanks' former teacher, Margaret Feely. And it was not long before Feely connected her pupil Dwight with the manager of an acting company, who offered the aspiring actor a job. The company was the Denim Stock Company, and they operated in a theater in Denver from 1913 to 1932. Every week, the troupe put on a new play, and their offerings ranged from religious holiday fair to melodrama to straight comedy and really everything in between. They did 10 performances every week and an evening show every night of the week with matinees on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Dwight made his debut at the Denim on June 16, 1918, in a play called The Man from Mexico. But while this may have seemed like an auspicious start for an aspiring young actor, things really did not quite go as Dwight Fry had hoped. He started out only getting small, minor roles, which was to be expected, but then he realized that as the company was fully staffed, he wasn't likely to move into anything juicier. So he quit, and he enrolled in business school at the University of Colorado. But he told the head of the company that he would go back to their theater troupe if something better opened up. And something better did open up. Just two months into his studies in business, one of the other actors from the denim left the troupe to fight in World War I. Dwight accepted the offer to replace him, and when he rejoined the company, he started using the F-R-Y-E spelling of his name, basically because he thought it looked better in print than the three-letter version. (laughs) Yeah, we don't know much about the logic of it other than that, like why he thought four letters and a last name was better than three, but he did, and that was how his name was spelled for the rest of his life. 
Reviews of Dwight's acting were not exactly ebullient initially. Uh, He was described as forced and as having an unnatural eagerness on stage, but it was also noted by critics as the season went on that he got better and better throughout it. I understand this criticism. I feel like that could describe my acting (laughs) as a teenager. Just the same, the man who had been running the denim company, O.D. Woodward, took the entire theater company to Spokane, Washington, and he brought Dwight along as the company juvenile. That meant that he would play all of the young man roles in the troupe's plays. This group actually debuted in Spokane just after the World War I armistice in the middle of the flu pandemic. And initially, they had to delay their opening because they were quarantined to make sure that all the players were, as Woodward promised, in the best of health. Yeah, during that pandemic, people were encouraged not to be traveling about, <laughs> not not to be, um, you know, in large crowded places. So there was concern that these actors had just arrived from another place. And what if they were sick and we all went to their play and everybody got really potentially mortally ill? So they had to wait for several weeks and just hang out in Spokane. But in Spokane, Dwight was very well received, with one critic writing that, quote, his heart and soul are in his work. He acted in 18 of the 21 plays that the troupe put on that season and even tapped into his piano playing skills for some of his roles. But the group actually splintered in the middle of the season due to disagreements between Woodward and the theater's business manager. After this run in Spokane, Dwight made his way to Chicago on the way to his ultimate goal of New York and Broadway. He appeared in one play in Chicago. It was The Dangerous Age before he moved on to New York. Dwight's first work in New York was as a vaudevillian, so he was touring various theaters on the circuit from Montreal to Texas in very lighthearted sketches and musical numbers. Yeah, he kind of felt like, that's fine, I'll pay my dues before I get a big Broadway uh, gig. I can do vaudeville for a little while. His first leading role on the vaudeville circuit was in a play called La La Lucille, which featured a couple who were in love but would have to divorce so that the husband could inherit his fortune. That's because the aunt who was leaving him this money did not approve of his wife. This is a musical comedy filled with wacky mistaken identities and cockamamie schemes. But the start of the run was abysmal. Dwight had been cast in the role without a lot of time to prepare, and that was true of the other performers as well. Many of them just didn't know their lines. One critic even called it ha-ha Lucille, and almost all of the early reviews panned the production. Things did get better as the tour went on, though, and it ran for 10 weeks. Yeah, there are lots of stories about how you could actually hear the script people in the wings saying more of the lines than the actors on stage. Oh, <laughs> because no. Because they were trying to stage whisper all their lines to them, and it was echoing throughout the theater. Uh, but it did get much better. Uh, (laughs) Dwight next signed on with the Merkel Harder Repertory Company, which kept a really grueling tour schedule. The group got Sundays off from performing, which was not the case with a lot of touring companies, but they did two shows a day every other day of the week, so they were still doing 12 shows a week. But soon, in May 1921, Dwight took a job with a non-touring stock company in Massachusetts. So we've talked on the show before about how really demanding the schedules of these kinds of jobs can be. And in the case of Fry's Troop, the colonial players, they rehearsed in the mornings, ate lunch if they had time to, then went into makeup to prep for a matinee, followed by the evening show. And every week they opened a new play. Yeah, so uh, I know we've talked about this before, but it always is just uh, a little bit frightening and leaves me in awe to think about the idea that you're rehearsing a new play every week as you're adding it. (laughs) (laughs) to the plays you are performing in the evenings. It's exhausting. Uh, Dwight was next lured back to Spokane by his former employer, Woodward, and his return was warmly received by theater goers. They had actually really missed him. I mentioned earlier he had been really popular when he was there the first time. Even though at that point a couple years had gone by, he was surprised at how warmly the audience greeted him on his return. While Dwight enjoyed getting to be the beloved returning actor, he still saw this as a detour from his ultimate goal of Broadway. But he also met a woman named Laura May Bullivant, stage name Laura Lee, in his second run in Spokane. Laura and Dwight were cast as each other's romantic interests, and later Dwight would comment that they basically got paid to fall in love and they were very happy to oblige. But they didn't stay together. They were both hustling to get their acting careers started, so neither of them felt they could really be tied down. 
Yeah, they called it quits at the end of the season. So uh, before we get to the next stage of Dwight's career, we're going to take a quick break and hear from one of the sponsors that keeps this show going. After that second run in Spokane, acting opportunities weren't exactly falling at Dwight Fry's feet. So he decided to return to Denver briefly to visit his parents and think things through. And he actually considered quitting the theater and going back to business. In a surprising move, his parents were like, no, no, this is your dream, do it, even though they hadn't been super thrilled about acting initially. And before he could get too attached to the idea of becoming a businessman, he went back to Massachusetts and he joined the Colonial Players for their 1922 summer season. And that proved to be a very smart decision. One of Dwight's fans in Massachusetts asked a connection from Broadway to come and see a Colonial Players show and scout Dwight Fry. And the producer, Brock Pemberton, was impressed with what he saw, so much so that he signed Fry to a contract after seeing him in exactly one play. Dwight finished the summer season with the Colonial Players and then headed to Broadway to appear in a play called The Plot Thickens. Dwight made his Broadway debut on September 5th, 1922. And while the play itself didn't get good reviews, Dwight did. The plot thickens only ran for 15 shows, but right after, Dwight immediately started a new play, The Absurdist, Six Characters in Search of an Author. The show had two test stagings, one in Scarborough and Hudson and one for the incarcerated population of Sing Sing Correctional Facility. Then it opened on Broadway on October 30th, and Fry got good reviews. The play ran for 137 shows, which was way beyond its planned four-week run. Yeah, that was not really a common practice to um, go to a prison and run a potential Broadway play as a test audience. But Brock Pemberton was a little bit outside the box in his thinking. He was like, well, there are no critics there, so we don't have to worry about that. And I will see what an audience who actually wants to be entertained thinks of this play, (laughs) which is pretty uh, interesting in terms of like a, a thought process. Laura Bullivant, Dwight's girlfriend from Spokane, had also made her way to New York, and she was working as a dancing girl. Late 1922 was a great time for Dwight Fry because his career was taking off, they were back together, and he was in love. After Six Characters in Search of an Author, Dwight moved on to a comedy called Rita Coventry, where he played one of the titular character's romantic interests who was also a musician. The play opened at the Bijou Theater on February 19, 1923, and it put Fry on the map. Reviews talked about how the show dragged until Fry showed up, and then it became delightful. The next morning, Dwight and Laura read the reviews together over breakfast. And based on the success of Rita Coventry, Brock Pemberton signed 24-year-old Dwight Fry to a five-year contract. From then, his career continued with a series of other well-received performances. He also returned as a featured guest to the Colonial Players in Pittsfield, Massachusetts in the summer of 1923, and he was the darling of that summer season. He even reprised his role in Rita Coventry with that stock company. The musical comedy Sitting Pretty debuted on Broadway on April 8, 1924, and as the star, Dwight delighted critics and audiences. It was during this time that powerful critic Charles A. Collins lauded Fry as the next John Barrymore. Yeah, at one point he was actually put on a list of like the the 10 best stars of Broadway, which was pretty huge at the time. Uh, in the 1925 melodrama Puppets, Dwight played a villain, a white slaver named Frank Mohax. This was a departure from the roles that he had been playing up to that point because he had done a lot of musicals and a lot of comedy and light fare. And the critics and audiences adored him in this villainous role. This was followed by the show A Man's Man in 1925, which is a story about a married couple who yearns for more in the ways that their desires are twisted by others for their own designs. While Dwight Fry had been lauded and praised for his work up to that point, A Man's Man truly made him a star. The reviews were all praise, and Dwight called it one of his favorite roles. A Man's Man ran for 120 shows, and Dwight's co-star in the play, Josephine Hutchinson, later talked about how immersed Fry would become in the role. In essence, he was method acting before that was a common technique of actors. She once told writer Gregory William Mank, quote, Dwight would come into the theater and so hypnotize himself into his role every night that I was afraid he'd kill me. Yeah, he was a uh, he was an immersion actor all the way, uh, beginning at the end of 1926 and running well into 1927. Dwight was in a comedy play, the title of which utterly charms me. It was "The Devil in the Cheese." 
Uh, this play had a, a plot as nutty as one might expect, with an Egyptian god appearing to grant one of the characters a wish after that man eats a piece of mummified 2,000-year-old cheese. I feel like this is a cautionary tale about our unearthed episode. I do, too. Uh, <laughs> in the cast, along with Dwight Fry, was also a foreign-born actor whose career would end up tied to Dwight's down the road, and that was Bela Lugosi. Both Lugosi and Fry got the best reviews of the cast, but they didn't become friends. After The Devil and the Cheese ended its successful run, Lugosi went on to star in the Broadway production of Dracula, and Dwight Fry went on to a whole string of jobs, some successful and some not, but he was consistently reviewed positively. Yeah, he was one of those actors that even if the play was a clunker, they would always go, but Dwight Fry was great. <laughs> like, he was kind of the saving grace of a lot of shows. In 1928, Dwight had great success in Mima, this time as another villain, a very cruel pimp with the nickname Alphonse the Spider. And the reviews of that play, which was set in hell and had a constant swirl of rumors about how the entire cast nearly had nervous breakdowns from the way that the rehearsals had been run, were not good. <laughs> it was not well-reviewed at all. But the dark nature of the material and the spectacle of the production, it was one of those shows where the sets were really lavish and expensive, continued to draw audiences. It made a ton of money and was a huge success, and it ran for 180 shows. On August 1st, 1928, Dwight and Laura got married. They honeymooned in Bermuda. Her career was also really blossoming, and during the run of Mima, she was in rehearsals and opening a Broadway show called Congratulations. That opened in April 1929, and it ran for 39 shows. After a very successful 1928-29 season for Dwight in New York, he opted to once again return to the Colonial Players in July of 1929 for another guest engagement there. And at the end of 1929, Dwight's Broadway career was undeniably successful. But as the Wall Street crash threw New York into a tailspin, because a lot of the people that were paying for Broadway tickets were suddenly without money, uh, Hollywood beckoned to a lot of theater actors. Dwight and Laura moved to Los Angeles, and Dwight started acting in L.A. plays, starting with Rope's End, which was based on a 1924 murder case. And just as he had in New York, Fry received praise for his work and soon was making a name for himself as a character actor. He also appeared in a revival of A Man's Man. All that positive critical attention that he was getting on stage paid off when Dwight started getting his first film roles. He first played a gangster in The Doorway to Hell in 1930, followed by a larger role in Man to Man later that same year. As 1930 came to an end, Dwight Fry's life had two big events unfolding. One, he and Laura were expecting a child. And two, he was cast as Renfield in Universal's Dracula. Dracula started shooting on September 29th, 1930. And just as with any other role, Dwight really threw himself into it. In the Bram Stoker novel, the stage play and film were adapted from, Renfield is described in the fictional journal of Dr. Seward in the following way, quote, sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. And Fry's portrayal of Renfield is a roller coaster of madness, from these really quiet and heartbreaking weeping moments to wide-eyed delirium, driven by being in the thrall of Lugosi's very seductive vampire. Fry in this part always reminds me of kind of a clenched jaw, and I've always described it that way, and then I was re-watching it prepping for this, and I realized it's because he has this posture where he leans slightly forward from his upper body, and he is sort of like clenching his jaw and pushing it forward, but he does that physicality in such a way that that's just how the whole role feels to me. Laura traveled back to Spokane, Washington to give birth while Dwight stayed in Hollywood for any reshoots that would be required at the end of Dracula's production. Their son, Dwight David Fry, was born the day after Christmas, December 26, 1930. Laura and the baby stayed in Spokane for six weeks before heading back to Los Angeles so that Dwight could meet his new son, who they nicknamed Buddy. Yeah, she had been in Spokane because her family was there, and because of shooting, she knew Dwight would not necessarily be able to help her out a lot and wait on her as she might need in her recovery. So that's why she was in Spokane's for so long. And we are going to talk about the release of Dracula and the films that Fry worked on after it in just a moment. But first, we're going to pause for a little sponsor break. When Dracula was wide released on Valentine's Day of 1931, it was an instant hit. 
It sold out show after show across the country, and it made Bela Lugosi a star. And for Dwight Fry, it got the attention of casting directors. He was cast in supporting roles after it in The Black Camel and The Maltese Falcon, immediately following Dracula's opening success. Then there was Frankenstein. Initially, there was something of a false start. Dwight was called in for a test by writer-director Robert Flory. Lugosi was in the same test as Dr. Frankenstein's monster. Fry was auditioning for the role of Fritz, who was a hunchback dwarf who didn't appear in the original novel, but was added for the stage adaptation. Yeah, and then he was included when that stage adaptation was adapted for film. Uh, Flory's test for Frankenstein is something of a controversy in film history. Flory always claimed that the test went great, (laughs) but stories have persisted that, in fact, it was a big problem, it was unintentionally comedic, and Lugosi was super angry about the whole thing and felt that the role, at least as it was written for that test sequence, was beneath him. And so the movie fell through for a variety of reasons. Dwight, in the meantime, had to mortgage his car to make ends meet. But then, former podcast subject James Whale decided to take on Frankenstein. He reworked the project, cast Boris Karloff as the monster, and started shooting in August of 1931. Fry remained in the role of Fritz, stealing a brain for Dr. Frankenstein's project, and then later taunting the monster mercilessly. Uh, As he had done on previous roles, Dwight would not drop out of character once he was in makeup, so he often frightened the cast and crew just by sort of lurking around the set. (laughs) Uh, This was in contrast to Boris Karloff, who, uh, if you look around online for very long, you will find pictures of this, but he took tea and he smoked and he played with animals in between takes, all in that full monster makeup. Uh, And filming wrapped on October 3rd of 1931. On November 20th, the film premiered through a series of soft openings before moving to the larger New York and L.A. markets. And that was done because Universal was actually concerned that it might be too frightening and they wanted to see how it played in small release first. They didn't need to worry, though. Frankenstein was an even bigger hit than Dracula had been. But at this point, audiences who had never seen Dwight Fry a year earlier had now seen him in two horror films, both times playing Mad Men back-to-back. He might have been able to do it all on stage from musical theater to serious drama, but to moviegoers, he was only this sort of creepy madman henchman type person. Yeah, it kind of bit him on the tail, uh, being as good as he was. Dwight had mounting pressure as a provider at home. His father had died, and his mother moved to California to live with his family in the Hollywood Hills. And he did get work. He had a series of bit parts in medium success films, but he was already suffering from typecasting. In 1933's The Vampire Bat, he played a simpleton named Herman who kept bats as pets, uh, and Herman is wrongfully scapegoated in the plot for a series of murders. It's a very charming. I really love The Vampire, <laughs> the, the vampire Bat, um, and there is one of the best um, shock takes in that movie ever by one of the actresses uh, in a scene with Dwight Fry, in my opinion. Uh, And it is apparent from this movie that already Hollywood saw this multi-talented and musically skilled actor, Dwight Fry, in just the one way. He really missed getting to play different characters, so he started stage acting again. He started living something of a bi-coastal life, traveling back and forth from L.A. to New York, touring plays and still working in film, although his film roles continued to generally be these creepy weirdo characters. In a way, he was living two lives in the early 1930s. In L.A., he had a typecast movie career, and then back on Broadway and in tours of the East Coast, he continued to impress theatergoers with his range. But somehow, he could never get these two worlds to intersect. Yeah, it's so strange, because he was so talented in so many ways, and it really come up doing comedy, so to then only get the one type of role over and over and over in Hollywood was really frustrating. But then he got offered a role as a good guy. It was still in a horror movie. Uh, That still fresh genre was all the rage at the time, and it was called The Crime of Dr. Crespi, along with Eric von Stroheim. Although after the picture was finished, it kind of lingered for a while without a release date until it was finally put out in 1935. In the meantime, James Whale made his second Frankenstein movie, which eventually became The Bride of Frankenstein, and he conjured a part for Dwight by cobbling together three smaller roles. Dwight had really loved working with James Whale, so he was really happy to do another horror film with him. As the character of Carl, Fry got a chance to be comedic and scary and to have a really fabulous death scene. 
Whale's second Frankenstein movie was a huge success. Yeah, in interviews with Dwight Fry's son, uh, his son will often talk about how he really credits James Whale with sort of saving them at a time when they were really desperate and he really needed acting work. And then he got cast, of course, in Frankenstein. So, uh, yeah, he really thought the world of James Whale. Dwight's options on Broadway uh, started to dwindle, so he started spending more time in Hollywood playing these bit parts and often wondering how actors who had stood in his shadow on the New York stage had more successful careers when they moved out to California than he did. We talked in our James Whale episodes about the 1937 film The Road Back, which was heavily edited to avoid losing the German market because of its anti-Nazi message. Dwight Fry had a bit part in this film, and just as Whale's film was cut down, so was Dwight's career, but it wasn't because of his involvement in this movie. He had just never really caught on as a screen actor that would be billed as a major player. Fry played an unsettling character on the L.A. stage in 1938 in a play called Night Must Fall. His former director from Spokane, Washington, O.D. Woodward, directed him in the part of a man who carried a woman's head around in a box. And that play ran at L.A.'s Mason Opera House in May of that year. In the summer of 1938, the Regina Movie Theater in Los Angeles was really struggling. The 640-seat venue wasn't selling tickets, and in a desperate move, the manager, E. Mark Eumann, booked a horror triple bill as kind of a stunt in the late summer. So starting in August of that year, they started showing Son of Kong, Dracula, and Frankenstein on one ticket. For some reason, this became one of the most popular tickets in Los Angeles with lines around the block and the theater running the bill at all hours and still selling out and turning away customers. I have a side theory about why this was so successful. And it harkens back to our air conditioning episode. Oh, yeah? So if you could pay for one ticket and get, like, five hours of air conditioning, wouldn't you do it? (laughs) Sure would. (laughs) For movies that had been really popular already. So there was, I mean, a, a... a little bit of nostalgia. It was only like eight years for some of them, but uh, I think that might have contributed to why that was so successful. Again, August in Los Angeles. So uh, this event really reinvigorated the careers of Lugosi and Karloff, and Dwight Fry was hoping for a similar lift. He actually took his son to one of these shows, and he was a little bit disappointed that Buddy enjoyed himself but was not the least bit scared. He was kind of hoping that Renfield would inspire just a little bit of terror, and instead his son just thought it was amazing and fun. Dwight was cast in Son of Frankenstein, which was funded in the hopes of cashing in on the new wave of interest in these older universal horror pictures. But by the time the film was edited, Fry's small part was completely removed from it. In 1941, Dracula was staged in Los Angeles at the Beaux Arts Theater. And for the stage production, Fry reprised his role of Renfield. He also continued to take bit parts in films, and he actually appears in a short film called Don't Talk, uh, which was made in 1942 and was nominated for an Oscar that year. But that was like a small, bright light in a dimming career. He needed to make ends meet, so he took a job at the Douglas Aircraft Factory and worked there as a tool designer at night. During the day, he continued to look for acting jobs. A really good acting opportunity came along when he was offered the role of Alexander Hamilton in the Broadway play The Patriots, but he turned it down. He wasn't willing to leave the family or leave his job at Douglas during wartime. It was a really difficult decision, though. Yeah, it's described by his son as like a very heartbreaking decision for him to make. Uh, And Dwight's last horror picture was Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. It was made in 1943. And that was followed the same year by two uncredited performances in Hangmen Also Die and Dangerous Blondes. His wife, Laura, picked up work as a store clerk to keep the family afloat. Finally, in late 1943, there was a ray of light. Fry was cast in a Woodrow Wilson biopic that was called Wilson. This was at 20th Century Fox. He had the smallish role of Wilson's Secretary of War, Newton D. Baker, but Fox was putting a lot of money into this movie. It was going to be their big offering of 1944, and it would be Fry's first color picture. Yeah, he was pretty excited that this was going to kind of relaunch his career. And on the night of November 7th, 1943, Dwight took his wife Laura and their son Buddy to the Pantages Theater to watch an RKO double bill of A Lady Takes a Chance and Sherlock Holmes Faces Death. Sets in that Sherlock Holmes picture were actually from films that Fry had been in. There was a set in it from Dracula and another from Frankenstein. When the evening's entertainment was over, the family walked to a bus stop at Hollywood and Vine. 
they boarded the bus back home. But just after they got on, Dwight collapsed in the aisle. An ambulance was called. He was taken to Hollywood Receiving Hospital, where he died shortly after arrival. He was 44 and had been really hopeful that his acting career was once again about to get underway, but he had died of a heart attack. His death certificate listed his profession as tool designer in reference to this work he was doing in the aircraft industry. And while Dwight's death was a surprise to virtually everyone, he had actually known for a while that he had a heart condition. He had had two minor heart attacks at work at the factory, and he never told his family about them, and he swore his coworkers to secrecy because he believed that he would be healed through faith, so he never sought uh, any medical attention. He was buried at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale. So it's a very sad end for Dwight Fry because he was very young, and I feel like he probably could have done a lot more interesting work. Uh, And like I said, I really enjoy him in a lot of movies, so I'm bummed that we don't have more of them. Uh, He, It's kind of interesting. He had never in his life gotten fan mail, and it wasn't until after he died that his family started receiving fan mail for his work. Uh, So he kind of got recognized after he had passed, but uh, not during his lifetime. Dwight Fry. I'm sorry, that was a bummer Halloween story. (laughs) Well, (laughs) it's also one of those which it it doesn't seem like it's going to be a bummer, and then it suddenly is. (sighs) Right, because it seems like, I mean, right at the end, it really seemed like it was about to turn around. (sighs) Sorry. Do you have some listener mail for us that's maybe... Not a bummer? I do. It's it's more of a thank you than a listener mail completely. Uh, there is mail involved, but I'm not going to read it all. Uh, it is in tiny script, and I'm not confident that I will read it all correctly. But it is from our listener, Jen. And Jen made a trip to the Melton Carnegie Museum, and she very, very kindly sent us a bunch of goodies. So we have... Um, Melton Carnegie Museum bookmarks and pencils and pens and these cute little pocket notepads and even pencil sharpeners. And I'm telling you, the weight of my heart is through school supplies. So this is heaven. So (laughs) thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Jen. It was an amazing little parcel to open. uh, And I really, really enjoyed it. And I was glad that she kind of had this connection to history uh, and Andrew Carnegie's history through our podcast. So I thank you very, very much. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also find us pretty much everywhere on social media as Missed in History. And MissedInHistory.com is where you can find show notes for any of the episodes that Tracy and I have worked on, as well as a full back catalog archive of every episode of the show that has ever existed. So we welcome you to come and hang out with us at MissedInHistory.com and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 